Welcome to Hillcrest. We are glad that you are taking the opportunity to view our latest video sermon. Our pastors are proud to offer another way for you to join with the church family in worship each Sunday. Please remember that live services are held at 8.45 a.m. and 11 a.m. every Sunday at Hillcrest on the corner of Halleck and Newland in Jamestown, New York. Now please enjoy today's sermon. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so I invite you again to open with me to the book of Genesis. If you're not already there, Genesis chapter 1. And again, their, their Bibles on seat back, sweet row. This morning, we're continuing this series, uh, as, as Kathy's already said, called Beginnings. And the title of today's message is Made for So Much More. Because even though things were made beautiful and wonderful and awesome, uh, we as humans have found a, found a, a real, real sure way of royally messing things up. And this series is all about beginnings. We talked the first week about, if you remember, exploring the, the beginning of the universe, the beginning of the earth, the beginning of, the, the, of man. And then we talked about the rhythm that's built into man of, of working six days and resting for one. Hopefully some of you got a rest this week, got a Sabbath. It's so important. Now today we're going to look at the beginning of relationships between men and women. And we're also going to see why those relationships are far less than what God originally intended. We were made for so much more. So let's begin again. We're in chapter one, and God has been on a a roll for five days. He's been speaking things into existence, been creating the vast galaxies, including our our Milky Way and our little solar system and the blue and green ball that we live on, we call Earth. And, And he's been creating the land and the sea and the plants and the trees and the birds that fly in the air and and the creatures that the, that dwell on the ground and crawl around there, and every fish and living thing that lives in the ocean calls that home. So at the end of, of verse 25, we, we read this, it, 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 God saw that it was good. And then God said, let us make man in our image, in the image of God, and, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Wow, and so my, it did just go out, Lyle. <laughs> wow. So let's see if I can reboot here. This could be interesting otherwise. Yeah, there we go. So, so uh, technical uh, glitch here. So... I rely on this nice, wonderful tablet, but I could see my battery was dying, so some of you saw me uh, uh, run to my good friend Lyle, and uh, he got me what I need, called a power cord. Let's see if I can get my code. Eh, Let's try this one more time. Yeah, love technology. All right. So verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We see here God's God's grand design for men and women. Unique to human beings is the fact that we were made in the image of God. Now, this word that we see over and over again in Genesis for God is the Hebrew word Elohim, which is a plural noun. Notice again, verse 25, God uh, God says, let us make man in our image. Now, who's he talking to there? Is he like talking to the angels? He say, hey, hey, Michael, hey, Gabriel, let's uh, let's make some human beings. Is that what he's doing? Is he talking to the angels? He's not talking to the angels. Angels were created by God, right? No, he's he's talking to himself. This This is a God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, holy huddle that we've got going on here. And so what I'm, what I'm getting at is that there is diversity in the Godhead. This is really important for us to understand, that God exists in three persons. And that is a mind blower. I, now, some of you are like me probably. I grew up in a, a faith tradition, right, that I just learned that from like day one. And, and that's one of, those th- one of the things that I've never really questioned. But I know for some of you, this is a big deal. You say, well, how in the world is that even possible? God exists as three persons and yet is one. And so that may be a, a stumbling block. And so some people have come up with examples or, or things to try to explain the Trinity. For instance, have you heard the water example? The, the water exists in three different forms. You've, you've got ice, you've got vapor, right? And you've got liquid, and yet it's, it's one. 
Yeah, <laughs> but it transforms from one to the other. To, it, it doesn't really work. Let's say, oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's more like, you know, you, like you're who you are, Pastor Mark. You know, you are, you are a son. You are a father, right? And um, what's the other one? I'm, um, son, a oh, husband. Sorry. Sorry, honey. That's... <laughs> That's right. But, but that doesn't really work either. Obviously, it breaks down. I can't even remember it. Um, and then, have you heard the egg example? Have you heard the egg one? Right? So, so you've got an egg, and it's got the shell, and it's got the white, and it's got the yolk. Yeah, but that, that doesn't, they're not equal, so it doesn't really work. Truth is, nobody understands the Trinity. And so, so if somebody says, I got the Trinity figured out, <laughs> either two things. One, they're, they're really confused. I mean, they, they really don't know what they don't know. Or number two, they're lying. And so, so that's it. And so if you're one of those people that, that say, I, I've got to have everything buttoned down before I can believe, well, you're never going to believe because there's, there's a whole bunch of things in this, this book that we take by faith. It's called a mystery. And so there are some things that are just beyond our puny brains and we need to be able to be okay with that. And the Trinity is one of those things. God declares the truth about who he is. He exists three persons, but is one. Now here's the amazing thing from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. You and I have been made in the image of the triune God. In other words, we have been made to show what God is like. God created human beings as male and female so that together we could reflect who he is. We could reflect his unity and his diversity. So just as God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who are, who are distinct in three ways, right? And they, and they honor, honor, and three persons, they honor one another, they respect one another, they submit to one another. We, in the same way, are, are different, but we are equal. Men and women are created with equal dignity and equal value and equal worth. Men are not more important than women. Women are not more important than men. Every single one of us has equal value, and together we reflect the glory of God, the very image of God. And that is an incredible reality. If you get your heads, heads around it. Okay, so let's move on. Let's skip down now to chapter 2, and to verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. Now, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right, skip down to yeah, verse 15. Uh, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it is, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, if you've been keeping track over the last couple of weeks, this, this is the first not good that we've seen. The first not good in Genesis is right here. You know, up until now, right? At the end of every day, God looks at what he has created and he says, this is good. This is good. But here, God says that something is not good. Now, did he, does he say that man's not good? No, he doesn't say that man's not good. Right? That men are bad. He's not saying that. No, he's, he's saying that, that men being alone, that man being alone is not good. It's not good for man to be alone. You see, here's the deal. Men alone, man alone are inadequate to show what God is like. And all the women said, amen. Yeah, yeah, you can preach that, brother, right? And all the young moms are saying, yeah, tell me about it. You know, I can't even leave the kids with my husband for five minutes. He can't handle that. So definitely, definitely, right? So, so God says, I'm going to make a helper suitable for him. And a lot of women really bristle at that idea. They, they hear the term helper, and many women think that that sounds very condescending. Uh, like women are lesser, like they are inferior. But here's the deal. Our English word helper comes from the Hebrew word azer. And it, that is the same word helper that, that's used elsewhere in the Old Testament. For instance, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present 
help in times of trouble. It's used for, that same word, helper, is used to, to talk about God. We get over into the New Testament, right? And we hear Jesus, Jesus say that I, it's good that I go away, that I go back to heaven, because if I go, the helper will come to you. That is a statement of power. That's a powerful word, helper. So when God says, I will make a helper suitable for him, he's not saying like Santa's little helper, okay? This is not, not, not that. He's saying, I'll make someone fit for him. So and here, here's the deal. Men and women were designed to complement one another. Now, that, there's an obvious biological connotation to that, but it's so much more than that. So it, it means that you've got people with, with two different people with different wiring, different gifts, different strengths. And, and so people who are equals, but distinct in, in what they bring to the relationship and distinct in the roles that they play. So that's why when we get over to, into Ephesians, uh, the New Testament, chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is very specific about the roles that, that are appropriate for, for men and women, and, and especially in marriage. And again, a lot of us will have hang-ups about that. We have a problem with this complementary idea that the Bible clearly teaches, and, that, and that's because of personal baggage, right? We, we, because our experience, um, what we've seen, what we've heard, and so on, the abuses that have gone on, we don't like the idea of women complementing men. And, and it's true, right? History is replete with examples of men using their strength to dominate, to overrule, to subordinate women. And that understandably, I mean, leads to a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of resentment. But, everybody say but. But that is not the picture from Genesis chapter 1 and 2 of the man being primary and the woman supporting the man, being her, his underling. If you, if you think that's the picture of Genesis 1 and 2, you're not seeing it. You're not understanding it clearly. No, we'll say it again today, what the Bible says. This, we see this all throughout the book of Genesis. This is a theme. that The Bible proposes a theocentric way of living where God is at the center of our lives. And so man and women to, men and women together work together so God can be clearly seen. It is good for a man to be a man. It is good for a woman to be a woman. But it is in working together in partnership that together they reveal and reflect who God is. All right, so verse 20 now, end of verse 20. But for Adam no suitable helper was found, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And I'm not the first one to, to point this out, and I won't be the last, but have you notice, right? Others have pointed out that, that God didn't take a, something from his foot, right? So that, that he, she would be underneath the man. Um, and he didn't take, a, take something from his head so that he, he, she would be over the man. No, she took a, he took a rib from his side so that she would be alongside the man. That to, again, together they would bear the image of God. All right, so verse 24, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is God's master plan for marriage, right here. This is the beginning of marriage, right here. And so what we have in verse 24 is covenant terminology, there's the leaving of one relationship so that a new relationship can be formed. God's plan, you see, is oneness. That's, that's his plan. There's, there's the leaving of a relationship and, and two dis different distinct people come together and they unite and they become one. Marriage is a covenant relationship between one man and woman, one woman. Marriage is not some you know, social construct. Marriage is not a government in, uh, invention. Does everybody understand that marriage existed long before the state of New York? Everybody got that, right? So, so it really doesn't matter uh, what our leaders can do to try to redefine marriage. I mean, they can, they can try and do that all they want, but it doesn't change the truth that, the, that marriage is a covenant relationship between one man and one woman 
with God. Plain and simple. Marriage is not some you know, strategy for people to live together. Marriage is not some plan uh, to populate the planet. Uh, and I, I tell this to, to, to couples that I'm counseling for, for marriage. Marriage is not a contract either to be negotiated or renegotiated or to be torn up and dissolved and, and removed. No, this is a man and a woman giving themselves fully to one another and in so doing something beautiful happens. We see the image of God in a profound way. We see the image of God who gives himself to his people and, and then receives from his people love and adoration and, and affection. So when we talk about marriage, it really doesn't matter what we think it ought to be. It doesn't matter what the best tax breaks are, you know, or, or, or what makes us happy. No, marriage was created by God and God alone defines what marriage is. And so then, sex is a beautiful gift to be enjoyed by a man and a woman inside the covenant of marriage. Again, verse 25. The man and his woman were both naked and they felt no shame. So for those of us who are single, sex with another person is, is not designed to be enjoyed outside the covenant of marriage. Sex is, the, is to be the culmination of, of a covenant relationship where sacrifice, where love and pleasure is mutually enjoyed by a man and a woman together. They are covenantly committing themselves, have committed themselves for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and health, until death do they part. And so that, that, that's why they can be naked and not ashamed. They can be fully known and fully loved. This, this is the beauty of the marriage relationship that God intended. Well, let me ask you, does this describe most of the marriages and, and relationships that you know? Does this describe most of the, the relationships in our country or, or even in our churches today? It does not, no. I mean, notable exceptions Notable exceptions here, but far too often what you see today is, is brokenness, is bitterness, is distrust, is uh, deep wounds, right? Um, scars, confusion, pain. And I am well aware as I looked at you at your faces this morning and as I stood and looked out at the 845 service this morning that some of us this morning, right now, are in, in incredibly difficult situations. Sexual abuse, harassment, separation, substance abuse, divorce, loneliness, sex attraction, gender dysphoria. I mean, th these are real situations for real people that are part of this family. And, and if we aren't dealing with that ourselves, right, we know somebody who is. We have a friend. We have a family member who are. Brokenness, I say, is epidemic. And, and if that's you this morning, if you don't hear anything else, I want you to hear this. God sees you. God loves you. And we are glad you're here. And this is, while it's not a perfect family, this is a good place for you to be. And we believe that there is healing and hope. And we, we, we commit to being there for you. We are glad you are here. But the sad truth is the picture of Genesis 1 and 2 is not the picture that describe relationships for many men and women today. Why? Why? I mean, what, what has happened? We're about to find out. Let's go on. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than all the wild animals the Lord God had made. So as we come to chapter 3, we're introduced to another character called the serpent. Now who's he? It's, it becomes pretty obvious. Kim read through it, right? Who he is in a minute. But you really have to go to the back of the book, to the book of the Revelation, to get more detail in his bio. And I'm not going to take you there this morning. We're just going to put this on the screen. This is from Revelation chapter Chapter 12, I'm just going to read it. 
And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he, but he was not strong enough. And they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So the serpent is, is Satan, the devil. The word Satan means adversary. And so if you put Revelation uh, chapter 12 alongside Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, and then what Jesus says and Luke records over the New Testament about Lucifer, an angel that falls, Lucifer, that, that, uh, that name means star of the morning, right? If you put all of those passages together, you get a fuller profile of, of the serpent that were introduced here in Genesis. And you find out that the devil was once an angel, perhaps the greatest angel that God, God created. His name was, was Lucifer. But he wasn't content to be a star. No, no, he, wa he wanted to be the director of the show. And so he led a mutiny, he, he led a coup in the heavenlies, and, and that coup, that, that, that battle, that rebellion continues to this day. But up until this point in Genesis, there, there was only one mind, God's mind. And there was only one will, God's will. And there was only one beautiful masterpiece, a grand composition being pay, pay, played. But, but now there's dissonance. There's an enemy mind. There's a rogue will that enters. And Satan is, is leading a rebellion. And in the verses that follow, we get a glimpse of his battle plan. So let's continue. Now the serpent was more crafty than all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And there we go. <laughs> Satan leading this, this rebellion, and, and we see his rebellion, his battle plan has three stages to it. And this, this is a time-tested strategy. This, this has worked for him for ages. And the first stage is to make us want to sin. That's the first. So, he, so what he does is he takes a natural, God-given desire and he twists it. He distorts it and he uses it against us. The question, was it, was it okay for Eve to be hungry? Obviously, right? <laughs> Hunger's a natural, uh, natural need. She, she needs food. And this is the same strategy he still uses with you and me today. So over in the New Testament, we read um, James, and James says that each one of us is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. And then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. James chapter 1. The only difference between us and, and Eve uh, in the garden is that for her, the tempter was on the outside. He was, she was innocent, and he's, he's reaching into her, trying to tap into her mind or heart and so on to tempt her. But since Adam and Eve's fall, the tempter has become within us. Our nature has been, has been warped and, and, and changed, and, and so we are always vulnerable. We, we are always open to temptation and attack. And this, this is why we, you know, we can go to the other side of the planet and still not be away from temptation. It's not a matter of, of geography. It's, it's a matter of our personality and the way we're wired, our very nature. We, we essentially carry him wherever we go. So Satan gets us to focus on our desires, distorts our desires to tempt us. And then number two, he, what he does is he substitutes a lie for the truth. He substitutes the truth with a lie. Did God really say he must not eat from any tree in the garden. Verse 2, the, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent says to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, what, what's Satan doing? He's planting a seed of, of distrust, distrust of, of God's love for her. And, he, and he's just raising a question, just that simple question. Did, did re, God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? 
How could a loving God ever say something as awful as that when these trees are obviously meant to, for you to eat from? And, and he does the same thing with us, right? I mean, how could a loving God say, don't, don't do that? How could a loving God say, don't, don't, don't give yourself to that? Don't, don't chase after that. How could a loving God ever do something like that? So the devil clear, uh, cleverly uh, uses her desires to plant a seed of doubt, and then, then he fertilizes it with a bold-faced lie declaring that what God said is going to happen isn't going to happen. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the, tr the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? Okay, skip down now to verse 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. But to the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pain and childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband. and He will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until, the, until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. So there's the third stage. Disaster. Satan brings disaster on us. I mean, he, he, he makes, I mean, whatever it is, he makes it look so appealing, so, so inviting, so wonderful. Just, just reach out and, and take it for yourself. And then, bam, I mean, he just drops the whole thing on you. The, the end result with him is always the same. It's disaster. Verse 23. So the Lord God banished Adam from the, the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And this is where all evil stems from. This is the root of everything that's broken in the world. It all goes back to the fall to, to our original parents and the garden. And so in the weeks to come, we're going to develop this further as we continue to make our way through Genesis. But that, that's as far as we're going to go today because it's time to ask our most important question. You know what it is. Lift up your voice. So what, right? So what? You say, Pastor Mark, I mean, talk about a downer. You're really going to leave us right, right here. Curses, banishment, disaster. Now, how in the world did we go from the, the wonders of creation and the beauty of it all to, to the mess we're in? I mean, wow. I mean, this is not exactly an uplifting message, some of you are thinking. What in the world are we supposed to do with this? And I hear you. And if, if we had the time, I would take you over to Romans chapter 5 in the New Testament. We're not going to do a long tour today. But I would show you the amazing thing that God has done for us. Um, in Romans 5, the Apostle Paul traces right back here to these, these verses, what, what happened in the garden, right here in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And he, and he traces out in detail how sin entered the world through one man named Adam and then has been passed down generation to generation to generation all the way to you and me. And, and Paul describes how sin has brought condemnation, it has brought guilt and shame, and, and 
it, is, it has separated us from God. And, and yet in the middle of all that depressing news, the Apostle Paul points to another man. And, he, and this term is the second Adam. And Paul says this, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's why Jesus came. That's why God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, became flesh, was born as a baby, grew to be a man, and then gave himself to die on a cross for you and me. To pay the price for our sin and to, to provide a way that our relationship with God could be restored. You see, sin leaves this giant cavern between us and God. One side God, on the other side us. And, and yet Jesus is the bridge over that cavern. And today he would restore your relationship with God. Not only that, but Jesus can heal what is broken in your life. Jesus can heal what is broken in you. And I get it. I, I can imagine some of you thinking, that, that sounds very, like a nice cliche. Easy for you to say. But I'm not seeing it. I mean, what I am dealing with seems impossible to see healed. Well, here's the deal. God is the God of the impossible. And, and he makes what seems impossible possible. And many of you know this to be true because you're a living example of it. Am I right? You've experienced this yourself, as I have, right? So it doesn't matter what kind of brokenness you're dealing with, or what you're living with today, what you're dealing with today. Today, Jesus would begin to deal with that. He would begin to heal what is broken if you will invite him and ask him to. So I'm going to invite everybody to just bow our heads and close our eyes. And we're going to do some praying together. And I'm going to ask you know, nobody to be getting up and moving around at this time. This is a sacred time. And I want to give you an opportunity to respond. And I'd like everybody to close their eyes, bow heads, and nobody looking around. Um, this is really about you and God. But I, I, want, to, I want to provide an opportunity because I, I believe, I believe that some of us this morning, when I talk about a cavern, a distance between us and God, we feel that. And so this morning, it could be this morning that you're, you're just feeling on edge. You're feeling, um, I don't stirred or agitated or frustrated. You're, you're feeling sad. You're, you're, there's something going on in you that you can't quite put your finger on. And I just want to say to you, as I often say, moments like this, right? It's not your breakfast. That would be the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you to lean into that voice. Lean into that stirring that's in you. It's going on right now because that is from a God who loves you and is reaching out across the cavern that exists between you and him. And right now wants to see that mended, see that bridged. He would do that today if you would but put your faith in what Jesus has done for you. And so I just, I just want to know if there's somebody this morning or several of us that would like to see that happen. And the way I'm going to do this, everybody else's eyes are closed, mine are open. And I'm looking around, but nobody else is. And if you look up and catch my eye, I will know, yeah, you're in that place this morning and you want me to pray for you. And I'm not going to call your name. I'm not going to ask you to stand. Not, I wouldn't embarrass you, but I would like to know this morning if I can pray for you. So look up, catch my eye right now. I'll see you. Yeah. And who else this morning? Say, I, I just sense there's such a gulf between me and God. Yeah, right. Who else this morning? Don't want this gulf. I'm tired of this. I want something to change. My relationship with God. Who else this morning? So there, there's not a magic formula. There's, there's not a, you know, a magic prayer to pray. It's the attitude of the heart. And, and it's, it's a, an act of the will to say, I believe Jesus came and died for me. I believe and today 
I again put my faith, or for the first time I put my faith fully in him. Lord, I want the, the gulf that exists between us to be fixed. Talk to the Lord in your own words. He hears you. He hears the words of your heart. Now, others of us this morning, as we've talked about relational brokenness and the struggles and the bitterness and the, the frustrations and the anger and all of the things we just are dealing with, truth is, we, we came to worship this morning and, and we were trying to suppress it. We were trying our best to keep it down, but it is right there. And if it isn't ours, we feel it for somebody else. We are just so tired of dealing with something so incredibly broken. And I want to say to you again that God sees you, God loves you, and we are glad you're here. And so I'd like to know if there, I can pray for some other folks. There were several in the first. Who says, yeah, just lift your hand up and say, yeah, that's me. I'm there. I'm there this morning, right? Who else? Who else, right? Yep. Who else? Okay. Who else, right? I see you. Who else? Okay, I see you. Who else? Anybody? Many of us. And so, healing begins as we begin to trust the healer more deeply than we have perhaps ever before. And just very honest with the Lord and say, God, this is so broken. It seems so impossible to me that something could ever be fixed. And I, I guess, Lord, I just want to pray. I want to just believe you for the impossible. You say you are that God, and I, I want you to be that God for this situation. So I, I just lift this before you right now. I lift this feeling, this, this need, this situation, this problem, this relationship to you, and I pray in the name of Jesus, that you would do something good in it. And Lord, I pray for each of those who have responded this morning. Lord, you know, you alone know all that we're dealing with. You alone see the real struggles of our hearts and our lives. You know what we're up against. So I pray that in every way you would be God that you would rule and reign, Lord Jesus, in our lives this week. Thank you for teaching us from this ancient book, of Genesis, this morning. And we look forward to how you're going to answer in your time and in your way. And we pray these things now in the name of Jesus. And we all said, amen. Hope you have a great week.